Well, today we're going to focus on the record of Luke chapters 1 to 2 as he introduces to us, as he sets forth in order, Jesus of Nazareth. And I have to say, I feel like this morning I'm carrying a million things in my head and it's about to explode because these chapters have to be one of the most intense, detailed, condensed and intricate string of Old Testament references and concepts that you could hope to come across. So today we want to focus on two particular things. First, we want to see the great mega panoramic global epic scale of the arrival of Messiah and God's work of salvation in Jesus Christ as Luke sets it forth in order of these introductory chapters. But secondly, we want to see the micro, the small lives in a worldly sense of unimportant individuals. Because that's what the story is about. It's the stupendous and awe-inspiring work of God worked out through the lives of individuals. And that's our personal story as well. God's outstanding and awe-inspiring work is worked out through the life of us as an individual. So today we're going to be part thematic because we're going to meet some characters, Zacharias, Elizabeth, John, Mary, Joseph, and they're all going to represent, they're all going to be playing specific roles in the narrative for a reason. But they're also very real people. There's real drama and character and lives embedded in this story and in this text. And there are very real lessons for us. So let's start with this wonderful manifesto of Luke. Now turn up Luke chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. The introduction he has in the first four verses is manifesto where he sets out his objectives, his motive, and his purpose. Luke chapter 1 begins, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? But just focus on these three key points that we highlight on the screen. Luke is saying, I'm writing to you across the centuries, across thousands of years, and I'm saying... First, other people were eyewitnesses of the things that I'm going to declare and set out in an order so that you might believe. I'm a collator, he says, of other people's eyewitnesses of these things. Second, note that he says, a goal I have is that the readers of this book are going to gain a certainty. They will know my perfect understanding as well as of these things. And third, See how he emphasizes there's something particular about his order. Verse 1, I've set forth in order a declaration of those things. Verse 3, that thou, or verse 4, thou mightest know the certainty of those things. Verse 3, I've written to thee in an order. And also notice, of course, the title of Theophilus, meaning friend of God, whether an individual or a collective concept. Those who love God. That's who he's writing to, and he's writing in an order. All right, well, what is his order? Well, it's a very intense order. You'll be thankful we're not going to go through all of this this morning, but very quickly, here's the first two chapters in their order as Luke sets it out. First of all, Gabriel appears to Zachariah in the temple, and John the Baptist is promised. Then Gabriel appears to Mary, and Jesus is promised. Then Mary visits Elizabeth, and they each prophesy. Then John the Baptist is born. Then Zechariah prophesies. Then there's a census and a journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Then there's the birth and only two verses. Then there's an angelic appearance to the shepherds. A dedication in the temple. Simeon blesses in the temple. Anna blesses in the temple. They return to Nazareth for his childhood years. Then they visit Jerusalem when he's 12, year old, 12 years old. Then they return to Nazareth for his teenage years. All in two chapters. Very intense and very in order. So let's begin at the start of Luke's order and see if we can gain his understanding in these first few chapters. As he commences in verse 5 here of Luke chapter 
one by introducing us to two hitherto unknown characters. Now, he doesn't expect us to know who these characters are, so this is where he starts. In verse 5 of Luke chapter 1, he says, It was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, when there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So just stop there and ask the question, why does Luke start here in all his order? What strikes us about these opening words? Well, this is a picture of priesthood, isn't it? Both of them. She's a daughter of Aaron. He's a priest of the course of Abiah, 1 Chronicles 24, verse 10, of the lineage of the Aaronic priesthood. Now, these two, said Luke in verse 6, are outstanding characters. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So can you see the picture that Luke is painting in the first step of his order? The open picture is one of the law, of the priesthood, in perfection, as it was supposed to be, a man and woman of the ironic line, blameless, righteous, walking in all the commandments. Now, you should note the meanings of the names because they're very important to the text. And we'll come back to those later. Zacharias means Yah has remembered. Elizabeth means God, or Ael, of the covenant, the Sheba, the oath. Abiah means Yah is the father. Now, why are these meanings important? Because they're all Abrahamic promise concepts. So just make a note, Exodus 2 verse 24, in Egypt it says, God heard their groaning of Israel, God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Psalm 105 verse 42, he remembered his holy promise and Abraham's servant. So God remembers the Abrahamic covenant and his promise is a thing. Elizabeth, of course, meaning the God of the covenant, or the oath, again, the oath is associated with the Abrahamic promise and covenant. Hebrews 6, 17. God willing more abundantly to show to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So the swearing of an oath was associated with the Abrahamic covenant. And finally, Abiah, Yah is the father. Well, it was always the intention of the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, that God would be the father of the seed. So we see the picture of Luke sitting out in order. Yahweh has remembered. Yahweh is the father. The God of the covenant. All powerful echoes of the Abrahamic covenant and promise. But that's not all. Where have you heard the echo of verse 7 before? They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they're both now well stricken in years, see the Abrahamic echo. So Luke begins with these two amazing characters. And they are standing here for the law and the priesthood as it was supposed to be, in its perfection, but who still cannot produce the child, the seed of the woman promised so long ago in covenant, sworn by an oath. And 42 generations after Abraham. It's well stricken in years, and the priesthood perfectly represented by these who can't produce the child, the seed. And that's the first of all the things in order, says Luke, that we need to understand. Now this man, in verse 8, is faithfully executing the priest's office. And see again in these two verses, this emphasis in the text on the priesthood. Verse 8, it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God, in the order of the course, according to the custom of the priest's office. See how the text emphasizes, this is the priest's office. Now it just so happened that at this point in history and in time, a lot had been taken, and it was Zacharias's lot to burn the incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now it suggested that there are around 8,000 priests in the days of Zechariah who were all available for duty, so by that time they'd actually broken the daily tasks down into four different groups. Some would burn incense, some would burn the offering, some would clear up ashes, others would do other tasks. 
So it's likely that Zacharias has only done this once, maximum twice in his entire life. Now Zacharias doesn't know yet. But in a moment, he's going to be swept up into the events that are going to change the world, that are going to make his name and the name of his wife and of his son and their reputation known to the ends of the world, even to Texas. And here, brothers and sisters, we get this glimpse, don't we, into the particular hand of God who set forth an order from the very beginning perfectly. Because on this particular day, as that rice turns and makes his way up into this large and imposing temple, behind him, verse 10, are the whole multitude of the people praying without at the time of incense. And just watch this picture of Luke as this faithful old priest makes his way up, past the table of showbread on his right, the lampstand on his left, towards the altar of incense in front of the curtain, carrying carefully this container of incense. We know he's a spiritual man. He's deeply feeling the personal responsibility. He puts the incense on the altar. The smoke and the perfume rose up. He bows his head and he prays as he was supposed to do for something. And he asked for something. And when he opened his eyes, there's an angel standing there. Verse 11. There appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of Israel. And when, of course, Zacharias see him, he's troubled and he's terrified. And this is no other than Gabriel. In verse 13, the angel says, Don't be frightened, Zacharias. Your prayer is heard. And we don't know what he prayed for because the text doesn't tell us. Did he pray for a child? Possibly. I don't think so because the text tells us they were well past age and he didn't believe the angel in any case. Did he pray for the coming Messiah? Well, quite possibly because we know faithful men and women were all expecting him at that time. Did he pray for his people and for their spiritual well-being? Did he ask God to turn their hearts to him? Well, I think he probably did because actually it was his task on that day, to pray on behalf of the people. Maybe he prayed all three, but nevertheless, we know the answer to the prayer, it was a son. In verse 13, the angel says, Do not fear, Zacharias, your prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And you'll have great joy, gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Just imagine this old man there, Hearing these words. And if that's not enough, he continues the angel, verse 15 and 17. He will be great in the sight of the Lord, will drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel will turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedience, the wisdom of the just, and make ready people prepared for the Lord. How incredible. So says Luke, you need to understand that from the beginning, the Messiah was going to be preceded by this one John the Baptist. And why should that be? Why does Luke say to the Theophilus, the friend of God, it's really important for you to know about this one John the Baptist? Why is it that finally when we come to the arrival of Messiah, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, well, we actually find almost like there are two. Elizabeth is going to have a son, John, and Mary is going to have a son called Jesus, and God's going to put them together, and Luke's going to set them out in order to give us a perfect understanding. So why did God arrange in his wisdom for it to be like that? Well, we know undoubtedly one reason is he did it for his son, because John the Baptist is clearly a dear friend and a source of encouragement and support for the Lord. But Luke's telling us that right from the beginning, these two somehow are fundamentally connected. And we're not going to do a complete study of John the Baptist, but we are going to highlight in the next slide three key elements of John the Baptist that we're going to need this morning. So let's spend a few moments just reviewing who and what John the Baptist was. And we're going to focus on three key things. First, John the Baptist was the messenger to prepare the way. Luke 7, verse 27. This is he of whom it's written, 
Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before me. Or Luke 1 verse 76, Thou child, talking of John the Baptist, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. So he's a messenger to prepare the way. And in one word, his message is <coughs> repent. Matthew 3 verse 2. John the Baptist saying, Repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3 verse 8. Bring forth fruits meet for repentance, says John the Baptist. Luke 3 verse 3. John the Baptist came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So there's no doubt that the message that prepared the way was, in one word, repent. Now that word repent, in the Greek, is metanoi. It means to change the mind or thinking. That's what it literally means. And John's message that prepared the way was this. Take a look at yourself. Look into the deepest, the most hidden recesses of your life, your heart, and your mind, and recognize that you need to make some changes. Now, you know, John's message is not new. In fact, John's message is simply the same message as all of the prophets. And for hundreds of years, the prophets have been saying the same message to prepare the way. Here's a couple of examples on the screen. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return, repent to Yahweh, and he'll have mercy upon him to our God. He will abundantly pardon. And the message of the prophet Isaiah to the people was the same as John the Baptist. Repent. Here's Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, verse 30 to 31. Again on screen. Repent, he said. Turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed. Make you a new heart, a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And you'll say, find the same message through all of the prophets. So that's the first key idea of John the Baptist. He's a messenger to prepare the way. In one word, repent, admit, acknowledge that you need to change. And it was the same message as all of the prophets. Now here's the second key idea about John the Baptist that we'll need this morning. John the Baptist is associated with and actually represents in the text all of the law and the prophets. Luke 16, verse 16 to 17, I'll read. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. So the law and the prophets, in some way, were until John. Luke 7, verse 28. Jesus says, I say to you, among those born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So John the Baptist is a prophet. The law and the prophets were unto John. His lineage is ironic by mother, father and mother. So he's of the high priest and the priesthood. He's a representation of of the law. His message was the message of the prophet. And it was repent, evaluate yourselves and change. So John represents all the law and the prophets. To this point, even the apex and culmination says the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because if you look at all the law or the prophets, he said the greatest thing is Jesus. Although with a little statement, note but he that's least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So that's our second key point. John the Baptist represents the law and prophets, encapsulates them as an idea and concept in the text. All right, here's our third key idea about John the Baptist this morning. John says Jesus is the greatest of the prophets, but Jesus. 
itself. It is far, far greater. So in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John is asked about Jesus Christ. And he says to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes, whose latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, and he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. So you see the picture that Luke's painting. Think of all of the prophets, from Moses, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, the great prophets of the Old Testament. And John the Baptist himself, says Jesus, is greater than all of them. But even that is the least, the least in the kingdom of God, is greater than he. But when John the Baptist looks at Christ, he says, well, how do I explain my relationship? The position I have is the representation of the Lord and prophets when I look at the Christ. He says, well, well, see my shoe latchet? I'm not worthy to unloose his shoe latchet. That's how much greater he is. So that's our final point we need this morning. John the Baptist is great, brother and sister. But Jesus far, far, far exceeds us. All right, we've covered a lot of ground very quickly, so let's just grab a summary platform. Luke's saying that inextricably linked to the birth of Jesus Christ is an elderly priestly couple. Their names are associated with the Abrahamic promise, Yah remembers, the God of the open covenant, Yah is the father of the seed. They have a son, John, Johannes, it means the grace of Yah. He is presented to us as the representative of all the law and the prophets and the greatest of them. And his message in that role captured in one word all the message of the prophets. Repent. Singular and powerful. Take a long, hard look at yourself and realize that you need to change and commit to that change. And all of the law and prophets to this point have been a schoolmaster leading to this point that we need Jesus Christ. And the genius of this epic work of God in bringing his son is that he would link two sons together. One is going to represent the message of all the law and prophets. The other will become the fulfillment of them all, total and complete. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, 18, Christ says, don't think I have come to destroy the law and prophets. I have not come to destroy. I have come to fulfill but verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle in no wise shall pass from the law till I have fulfilled it all. So John the Baptist is the message to us that everyone who comes to Christ must do so in the spirit of repentance. In a recognition that we need to change, that we want to make a change, that we want to change our mind and our thinking. John the Baptist's message, his way of preparation was convincing them of sin and their need for forgiveness to lead them to the Christ. That was the message of all the law and the prophets captured in John the Baptist as their representative. One was great but Jesus Christ is going to be far greater. Now come with me to a great quote. It's going to cement the concept. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11, where the writer of Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, sets out the contrast between the ministration of death, the law, the old covenant, and its glory, with the new in Christ that was much more glorious. Same principle and concept. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. If the ministration of death, written as graven in stones, was glorious, so the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glorious, much more, not that 
but it much more, we're going to come across it in a moment again, does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. For if that which is to be done away is glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. You see how it mimics the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ? John says, I must decrease because I represent the old. But he must increase because he represents the new. That's the message of John. Come back to Romans chapter 3 verse 19 where we see the same thing. Romans chapter 3 verse 19. I'm going to take a small license with the text with respect to it where we're going to replace the word law with the name John the Baptist. And you will see the point and the sense of what he represents. Romans 3 verse 19. We know that what things soever John the Baptist has said it said to them who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Repentance. Verse 20. Now therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by John the Baptist's message by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being Witnessed by the message of John the Baptist, the law and the prophets that he represented, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, to unto all, upon all them who believe that there is no difference. So God, in his infinite wisdom, brought these two women and two sons together, one the messenger, with a message of repentance, with a name Yahweh is grace. And another, whose name means Yahweh, saves, who would transcend in glory and in power. You know, it's an interesting thing when you examine the text, that these two boys overlap. Everything about them, their lives overlap. The pregnancies of their mothers overlap. Their ministries overlap. Their messages are going to overlap. One's going to be the last resounding voice of the law and prophets in the wilderness, prepare the way, confess and repent. The other's going to be the whole fulfillment of the law and prophets and their end, bringing in the salvation of God. One will baptize with the baptism of repentance and his name will be John, Yahweh's grace. The other will baptize with the baptism of salvation because his name will be Jesus, Yah saves. And notice how they don't just one ends and one starts, they overlap in partnership. They are connected. So that's why we see The first thing in order that you need to understand is that John and Jesus go together. All right, well, that's our foundation this morning. Take a deep breath because now we're going to bounce off that foundation into the big picture itself. I mean, we can see, can't we, that John and his origins are being painted in the text as representative and standing for the law and the prophets and their message. Recognize the truth of your position. Change, repent. It leads them to Christ. We can see that Jesus would be infinitely, vastly greater because he would be the forgiveness the Lamb who would take away the sins of the world, which the law and priesthood could never do. We can see the what. But why? Why would God do that? And the answer is that the Heavenly Father takes every one of His children through this process. And you and I are going through a process right now it's the process of John and Jesus. They are the process. They overlap. They connect. And it's the process of the atonement, the saving work of God. Because what Luke's really doing in the big picture is he's setting out the salvation and atonement plan of God that we all go through. John and Jesus together in a relationship of great and far greater the messenger to prepare the way, and the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, are 
set out now in order in the book of Luke as the foundational principles of God's salvation with every one of us. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes now just seeing how they do that. Quick little refresher on the atonement and the saving work of God. The atonement, of course, as we're shown on the screen, is portrayed as consisting of two parts, each related to each other, that overlap. Both are necessary, but one is much greater than the other. There is the death and the life, both critical, both need, but one is greater than the other. Now turn up Romans chapter 5, verse 10 to 11 with me, where we see that beautiful statement, the setting out of these two principles in the same work of God. In the atonement, there is a process. Now see if you can see the two parts of this and a relationship between the two of them, the death and life of Christ. Romans 5, verse 10. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, there's our, our term, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we've now received this atonement, our reconciliation by his death, transcended by a salvation by his life. And everywhere you look now, you will find the two parts of this process. We're in Romans, so turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 4, the baptism chapter, and look for the two parts again. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should walk in newness of life, reconciled by his death, saved by his life. That's why John and Jesus are put together. So we can see the saving process of the Father in the Son, Jesus Christ. And this is the process that we all go through. First, there needs to be a confession. God is right. I'm wrong. I admit then there needs to be a commitment to change. I'm sorry, I want to change. Then there is a forgiveness, a cleansing and a washing. And then there is a new life, a living of a new person. John the Baptist captured only the first two. The representation of the law and the prophets. But it still could not save. Because the Lord Jesus Christ needed to come to encapsulate it all. The fulfillment of the law and the prophets forgiveness of God and the newness of life much more. You know, there's only one recorded instance in the Gospels of these two, John the Baptist and Jesus meeting in the Bible. Come in Matthew chapter 3 and you'll see this process, this overlap of these two to represent the saving process and purpose of God. Matthew chapter 3 verse 13 to 14. And of course, this is the baptism Jesus by John in the Jordan. But watch for the two parts of the atonement, the two stages of the process of salvation represented by John, represented by Christ, and then swept up together and totally encapsulated in the work of Jesus Christ himself. Matthew, Matthew 3 verse 13, then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptised of him. Interesting, you note that it uses the names, not the titles. Yah saves, comes from Galilee, to Yah is gracious to be baptised with him in Jordan. But John, who represents the law and the prophets, forbade him, saying, I am me to be baptised of thee. Comest thou to me? Thou art much greater than I. But then look at Christ's words. Verse 15, Jesus answering said, Suffer it. Again, make a note, that's the term aphaemi, means to send forth. Actually, it's used to denote forgiveness. It has scapegoat connotations as well. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us, you and me together, John, to fulfill all the righteousness and the ellipsis of the law of prophets, Matthew 5, 17. And so John sent to forth, suffered him. That's the death. Look for the transcending life. Verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. The life and lo, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove 
and lighting upon him a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Two women, two sons, one great, the other much greater, one the last greatest representation of a born prophet, the other their fulfillment, end and transaction, the process and power of God's plan of salvation, the atonement. Right, I want to do a quick exercise now, just to take our minds through this process in a small but representative way, so hopefully you get a sense at a personal level of the process the Father takes us through and is represented here in Luke. So I'm going to give you a minute, don't tell anybody, just think of your own personal greatest spiritual weakness. I think we all know what our own personal spiritual weakness is. So look inside your own heart, your own <coughs> mind, corners of your own life, and think, just reflect on your greatest personal spiritual weakness. Think about how it makes you feel, think about how it makes or affects your life and relationships. I'll give you a minute. Alright, so in some small representative way, we've just gone through. John the Baptist's message. Acknowledge. We have a problem. And I want to change. Repent. And that's the first part of the process that God takes us on. And when we come to God like that, and we say to God, I have a problem. I want to change. He says, you've just declared that I am right. And in Jesus' name, I will forgive you. You know what the thinking of the flesh does now? It goes, what about the payment? What about reparation? What about the penalty? What have I got to pay now? And God says it's free. It's no payment. It's the principle of forgiveness. You're now reconciled in the death of my son, Jesus Christ. Now, go and live a much more powerful principle, live in Jesus Christ, a changed way of life, live much more. So that's the process, beautifully moved and welded together, of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, overlapping in the text of Luke and set forth in order. Right, we're going to finish the story now by going back to Luke chapter 1, and very quickly finishing the story. You see, because as Luke sets out in order, we're going to move now to this little village in Judea. And witness this great and this joyful scene, the birth of John the Baptist himself. So back in Luke chapter 1, and verse 57, it says that Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brings forth a son. But just imagine this scene, this elderly couple, beside themselves with happiness and joy and beaming smiles and Tears of happiness. You see the picture in verse 58. Friends and family gathered. Her neighbours, her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy on her. And they rejoiced with her. And all the sin was there. And she was holding the baby. And they were taking a look. And they were saying, isn't he cute? And he looks like his dad. And they were going, oh, great set of lungs he has. Just like grandma. And it came to pass, verse 59, that on the 8th, Day they came to circumcise the child, and they, the relatives, call him Zacharias. Let's call him Zacharias, just like his dad's name. But there's a problem because Zacharias can't talk. And he's sitting there going, mm, 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 mm. and they come to him and they ask him. And he can't speak, of course, because the angel told him when he asked for a sign, Gabriel said, Behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day these things be performed, because. Thou believest not my words, which will be fulfilled in their season. So verse 62, they make signs to the Father, how we have him called, and he asks for a writing table, and he writes, his name is John. Yah is grace. And they marvel all. Don't you love the way the word does this? And Luke sets it out in order. Verse 64. Immediately his mouth is opened and his tongue loose and he spake and praised God. You see the point? Because of unbelief, the message of the law and prophets could not have been heard. 
And for generations and hundreds of years, it was dying and bursting out was the message that Yahweh is grace and it couldn't be heard. But immediately on acknowledging the name and the principle of Yah is gracious, the tongue is loosed and this magnificent prophecy comes out. And we haven't got time to do justice, so we're going to do just an overview of this prophecy. But it's going to be enough. A fantastic prophecy comes out from the mouth of Zacharias, and Luke gets it all down perfectly in order. Now let me just explain to you, it's on text, so it's very small, but it's really the design of it. So the, the prophecy of Zacharias is a chiasm, it's chiastic. So I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that a chiastic structure has the point, the central idea, right in the middle. And it begins from both the beginning and the end with a message, and it steps into the centre. So you'll see that in verse 1. Where it says, He has visited and redeemed his people. At the end, verse 78, the high, most high, or the day spring on high, has visited us. Then it steps one step in verse 69 in green, he raised up a horn of salvation. Verse 77 in green, a knowledge of salvation. Verse 70, he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. Verse 76, reference to John the Baptist, the prophet of the highest. Verse 71, stepping in one more step. He saved from their enemies. Verse 74, to deliver out of the hand of our enemies into the centre of the chiasm. So following that structure, God has visited his people. Next step in. He's raised them up a power and knowledge of salvation. Next step in. He spake this by all of his prophets and the greatest of all, John the Baptist, the prophet of the highest. Next step in. To save them and deliver them from their great enemy, which we know is sin and death. And then right in the middle, verse 72 to 40, 73, is this little glowing gem. Actually, there's two little glowing gems. The Zacharias and Elizabeth. <coughs> verse 72. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to Zachariah, remember his holy covenant to Abraham. The oath to Elizabeth, which he swore to our father Abraham. The covenant promised to David and Abraham so long ago. Another representation, another Abraham and Sarah, who in their old ages, barren, past bearing, are given a seed to prepare the way, to bring the message bearer, to prepare the way of the Lord. So our exhortational lesson this morning and takeaway, brothers and sisters, is this. While we're here in this spiritual environment, while we're here supported by our brothers and sisters, let us each take a look into the deepest, to the darkest, the most hidden corners of our hearts and our minds and reflect on our own spiritual weakness that's peculiar to us, our own weakness. And let's begin the process of salvation and atonement and listen to the words of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring it to God and say, I acknowledge. I want to change. And do it because he is John. God is gracious and he will forgive. Doesn't matter how big it is. Doesn't how small. There is no price. No fee, no penalty, no payback. It's his gift. His reconciliation won through the death of his own dear son. And then let's take the next step on the process to leave this place and live much more. Walk in newness of life. Be saved much more by the principle of his life lived in ours. That's the order, says Luke. That's why God brought two sons together and overlapped them to represent the fullness, the glory of the process of my salvation in Jesus Christ.